One of the greatest plays in college football history is the play. You might remember it. The band is on the field, right? Cal and Stanford, November 20th, 1982. But what you don't think about when you think about that game is one of the key players that was involved had a heck of a game receiving and also played a huge role in all the laterals that ended in that touchdown. Now he's serving 45 years for murder. Today, we'll tell you the story of Moret Ford. This is Distant Replay. So we're talking about Moret Ford today on this episode of Distant Replay podcast. And this is an interesting case because I think as we both would agree, there's not a lot out there, Mike. Is that why you, this one really caught your attention? It caught my attention because it came up in my research and I saw the name Moret Ford. First, I had to look up how to pronounce his name properly. And secondly, I had to look up Moret Ford. Who is that and what did he do? Because I had never heard his name, didn't know how he was related to the sports world, and certainly never heard of any of the crimes that he's involved in. Yeah. So let's hop into it because this is a very interesting story and one that, you know, still, I don't know that we'll say that it's still got an open kind of case at the back end, you know, who, who really is responsible for this crime, but it still has that element to it. So let's get it going again, early life with this guy who is Mered Ford. What do we know about him? Yeah. So before I get into that, just so everyone knows, I think what Ben hit on is key is what we're going to do here is kind of lay out all the information that's, that's publicly available and sort of let you guys make a conclusion on what you guys think. Yep. You know, that's sort of our goal with these here. And early life for Moret Ford. All right, he grew up in Walnut Creek, California. By all accounts, he had a nice upbringing. Okay, his dad was a telecom worker. His mom worked at a local hospital as a clerk. People growing up, nice kind of shy kid, typical, typical suburban kid. Went to Northgate High School, then went to a junior college called Diablo Valley College where he was in All-America, right? So Moret Ford was a wide receiver, kick returner, punt returner type. Okay. Wasn't that big of a guy, only like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, so we're talking about a little kind of speedy kind of punt returner, kick returner, wide receiver type. After doing very well at Diablo Valley College, he played for Cal, University of California Bears, during the 81 and 82 season. And in both those seasons, he was the team's best receiver. Now, if you look back at his numbers, he had like 600 yards and 500 yards receiving respectively, mm -hmm. along with being a good kick and punt returner. And you might say 600 yards receiving. Well, back then, you know, the top guy in the Pac-10 only had 850 yards receiving. So he was the best receiver on Cal in the top 10 in receiving in the 81 season in the Pac-10. His last college game was one of the most memorable college games and featured one of the most memorable moments maybe mm. in sports history. Ben, when I mention to you Cal football, what yeah. is one of the first things you think of? I think of Marshawn Lynch. Aaron Rodgers and the play. The play. Cal Stanford, the play when the band is out on the field the band in comes November on the of field. 1982. We've all seen the highlight countless times. Moret Ford in that game had seven catches for 132 yards, his best wow. college game, and a touchdown. As I mentioned, it was his final college game, and he played a very integral role in the play. Ben, if you remember, do you remember how many laterals that play featured, Ben? I don't even know. What, 10? Five laterals. Okay. And he was the fifth lateral. Wow. So we went from Moen to Rogers to Gardner to Rogers to Ford and then to Moen for the touchdown. So if you look hmm. at the, the very last lateral, right before Moen gets the ball, runs into the end zone and plows over the trombone player, that's Moret Ford throwing the ball over his shoulder to Moen, who then runs in for the touchdown. So I'll probably never watch that game the same again, or that play the same again. It's funny you bring that up because when this game is talked about, they do a lot of like this moment type features on this that I looked up on YouTube, like all the people involved with the play sort of talking about it. Right. Moret Ford is glossed over. His name is oh, never gosh. even mentioned um, in the highlights, in, in the features. And this is when I was doing my research. That's one of the first things I watched was like a sort of a this day in sports on the, uh, you know, on the, on the play with the people involved. Yeah. And they didn't mention Marette Ford's name. And I'm like, huh, I got to look more into this guy's story. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We'll get into why he's not mentioned, you know, why he's not mentioned when they go over that play here in a second. But remember, this is a guy integral role in one of the most memorable plays in college football history. Yeah. And Ben, you tell me if I'm wrong, this may be one of the most, you know, memorable plays in sports 
period history, you know, sports history period. Yeah, I mean, it's got a yeah, it definitely ranks up there across the board and just iconic plays and and one that you see and kind of everybody would recognize, no matter kind of how big of a fan you are of, of football or not. Yeah, it's up there on everybody's list. So the fact that he had a hundred over 130 yards receiving in that game and the final lateral, it's pretty nuts. It is crazy. Now, again, that was his last college game. He was signed as an undrafted free agent with the Falcons, cut during training camp, bounced around the CFL, playing playing for Toronto and Ottawa, tried out for the USFL, but didn't make it. So, you know, his his football career sputtered out, basically, for lack of a better way to put it. He retired officially from football in 1985. Okay. So now, a little bit about his post-career, and then we'll get into his crimes. His first marriage ended in 1990 after three years, Okay. And in March of 1992, he, so this is, you know, a full 10 years after the play, okay? Right. He meets Teresita Cabello at a nightclub in San Francisco. We're going to call her Tess from this point forward. Okay. They married three months later, and at that point, Tess is pregnant with their first child. Okay, pretty quick. Yep. So fast forward to 1997, 15 years after the uh, the play happens, Moret is no longer playing football. He's working as a salesman for a commercial voicemail company called called Voice Pro. Okay. Himself, Tess, and three year old Moret Jr., who they called Momo, are living in the Sacramento suburb of Elk Grove. Kind of like been a typical upper middle class area, cul de sac, basketball hoops in the driveway, well kept mm-hmm. properties. Okay. You know, I think you kind of know the neighborhood I'm talking about. Yeah, right? definitely. All right. The morning of January 16th, 1997 is when this family's life would change forever. Moret called his brother Oren. His brother Oren was his best friend and also played wide receiver at Cal. Okay. So Moret calls his brother and says, hey, look, can you go check on Tess? At this point, Tess is eight months pregnant, by the way. And what Moret tells Oren, his brother, is can you go check on, on Tess because – she planned to call out from work today because she wasn't feeling well, and she's not answering the phone. So Moret's trying to call her, and she's not answering the phone. So he's like, hey, can you go over and check on her for me? So why why was he not able to check on her? That's a great question. He says that he's out on the road trying to make things happen as a salesman, you know? So okay. he's not really proximity-wise near their house, you know, to go check up on them. Gotcha. So Or Orrin Ford arrives to the house. Goes in, goes in the front door, makes his way into the dining room, and discovers something completely and utterly horrific. One of the toughest crime scenes that we've talked about on this show. He finds the burning bodies of Tess and Moret Jr. on the floor in the dining room. Jeez. Picture this for Oren. I mean, he later testified at trial, you know, to what he saw, and they, by all accounts, this was the most emotional part of the trial, largely based on Oren and how emotional he was. I can't imagine this. I mean, you walk in and your nephew and your sister-in-law are, are burning. You know, their bodies are burning on the floor, and you're the first one to see it. It's horrible. Terrible. So now we have two people dead, Tess and Moret Jr. Their autopsy showed that they were dead before their bodies were lit on fire. Okay. So then the next question to that is, well, then how did they die? Right. And this was, it's kind of tough to read. It's going to be tough to hear, but just to quickly go through it. Moret Jr., remember, this is a three-year-old kid 20 days away from his fourth birthday. Moret Jr. dies from repeated blows to the head. So he was just beaten in the head until, until he died. Test the specific method of how she died could not be confirmed, but she had several injuries broken clavicle, broken ribs, broken jaw, a very savage beating of Tess. She just basically got beaten to death, Man. okay, for lack of a better way to put it. The the beating of both of them was very, very savage from the way it was described by investigators and from people who reported to the scene. And remember, added into all this is with Tess, their unborn child is gone as well, Okay. So just a terrible story all the way around. Yeah. Now, the next thing that comes is obviously the police investigation into who did this. Right. 
In the coming months, police interview Moret three times. Now, inconsistent statements he made during those interviews lead him to getting arrested six months later. So six months after the crime happens, Moret is charged with the murder of Moret Jr., Tess, and their unborn child. Okay. So some heavy stuff. And right. this is at the time where the media starts to pick it up because, again, he's still living in Sacramento, you know, not not far from, 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 from Berkeley, relatively speaking, still in Northern California. So this is a big, this is a big deal out there when this is happening. Yeah, I mean, we're only, what, 15 years removed from the play? Yeah, 15 years removed from the play, exactly. Yeah. Still, still to this day, one of the most memorable plays in college football history, never mind, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. Okay, Ben, so now we get into the trial, all right? So the trial at this point is like a, I don't say a spectacle, but it's being covered by the media pretty substantially because I might not know who Moret Ford is, you might not know who Moret Ford is, but in the Bay Area and in the Sacramento area, he's very well known from his days at Cal. So during the trial, the deputy district attorney for Sacramento County is a guy named Mark Curry. He presented no actual physical evidence linking Moret to the crime, okay? But the working theory the prosecution had was that Moret had an unpremeditated explosion of violence. He lost his temper, beat Moret Jr. and test to death, and then tried to lie to cover it up. Remember, I, I, was, I talked about those inconsistent statements yeah. that led to him getting arrested? We'll get to those in a second. So you're, you might ask, well, why, well, what was their theory? Why did he do it? What was yeah. his motive? Why did he do it? They say he was a philandering husband. Moret, even during this trial, admitted to having multiple affairs. He also had mounting debt. They say that the pregnancy that, Mer that Tess had with the eight-month-old was unplanned, and mm -hmm. Moret was upset about that. And then they had not only mounting debt, but other financial trouble. So they're saying, if you look at all this stuff, this is the theory that we have as to why Moret, you know, killed his wife, his unborn child, and his son. So on the surface, so no on the surface, everything looked good. But what they're saying is behind closed doors, he was dealing with a lot of stuff. Dealing with a lot of stuff and just in like an unpremeditated ra rage, you know, went, went crazy basically. Right. Now, I mentioned before, no physical evidence. So if there's no physical evidence... The next logical step is, okay, they must have had some circumstantial evidence that they felt was pretty strong enough to bring murder charges against them. Mm -hmm. The circumstantial evidence included they found gasoline on Ford's shoes. They found fresh scratches on his face. There was a 30-minute gap in his alibi. His gas container was missing from his garage, even though he owned a gas-powered mower. Okay. And that there were no signs of forced entry into the home. Hmm. So you have this circumstantial evidence combined with his inconsistent statements. And Ben, there was three inconsistent statements that all accounts from the trial say really, really hurt Moret in the eyes of the jury. Okay. They got to be strong because, I mean, obviously all you have now is circumstantial, although you know, the gas on his shoes and the fresh scratches. There's there's some pretty strong stuff there, but these statements must have been pretty bad. Yeah, so th these were the, the first inconsistent statement, Ben, was Moret said he was very sure he left his house for the day at 5.45 a.m., but then backed, out, backed off those statements when the gas station cameras showed him arriving to the gas station at 6.28. Okay. All right. The gas station was only 11 minutes from his house. So okay. that's where you have the 30-minute alibi discrepancy. Okay. The second inconsistent statement. He said that the scratch on his face was from Moret's sword, Moret Jr.'s sword. So he had like a, a wooden toy sword. Yeah. That Moret said, oh, he scratched his face with that when he was playing with Moret Jr., Okay. He said that that incident with the sword happened on Monday the 13th. Now, the murders happened on a Thursday, okay? He says that the incident with the sword happened on the 13th. Then he changed it to Tuesday. Then he changed the statement to Wednesday. And none of Moret's coworkers remember seeing a scratch on his face during this time. Mm. Like it was supposedly like a pretty substantial scratch that they would have noticed if it was there. Yeah. The third 
inconsistent statement in an interview with police, he referred to the murders as an accident. And the prosecution said, why would someone whose family had been murdered like ever call it an accident? Right. Yeah. You would never defend whoever did this to your family. Yeah. You would never make excuses for them. Right. Right. You murdered my family. It was no accident kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, Ford's responses to all this, um, to these, the circumstantial evidence and to the inconsistent statements. First, now he testified to all this in court. He said he spilled gas on himself while filling up that morning at the gas station that I just mentioned. Yeah. And that's how the gas got on his shoes. As I mentioned before, he says the scratch on his face was from Moret Jr.'s wooden toy sword. He says they were not having financial troubles. He fought back on that notion altogether. And he said that the pregnancy was planned. So he's basically saying, hey, look, all the circumstantial evidence or, or theory that you have, he's basically going through point by point and refuting all of it. Okay. Right. Got to do that. Yeah. As far as the memory stuff goes with, you know, not remembering the day with the sword incident happened, you know, not being sure when he left his house to go to the gas station, Moret just chalks that up and says, testifies at trial. Like, look, those were just mistakes. They were lapses in my memory. Like I just got that stuff wrong unintentionally, unintentionally. Deny, deny, deny. deny. He denies everything that the prosecution is saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the inconsistent statements hurt him, but what also hurt him even more was the jurors noticed how calm Moret was during the trial and during his cross cross examination. And supposedly by all accounts, that really turned off the jurors. The most eye-popping example of this to them was during the trial when his brother Oren was testifying that I mentioned before. This was a situation when Oren was describing coming into the house and what he saw with those bodies burning. It was one of those, and you've probably seen a trial like this, Ben, where what they're describing is so horrific that like there's not sort of not a dry eye in the house. Yeah. Like – you know, everyone's getting very emotional, including Oren on the stand in this case. He was very emotional on the stand. Some of the lawyers were even having trouble, like choking back tears as they were questioning Oren. And during this time, he showed no emotion. Hmm. And Moret's response to this was, you know, hey, look, I, I show emotion in different ways. I was dealing with a lot. And, you know, it's just not in my nature to react out in public and cry like that. Interesting. So he even has an answer for that. Right. So with all this circumstantial evidence, the inconsistent statements, this is what the jury has to consider, you know, when they're trying to deliberate and determine, you know, should he go to, should he go to jail for the murder of his un unborn child, Moret Jr. and Tess, right? It took them five days to deliberate. I'm glad they put in their time. I hate when you hear these cases and, you know, it's, it's a day or it's four hours or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To their credit, five days to go through all the evidence. And on April 22nd, 1998, the jury found him guilty of three counts of second degree murder and one count of arson for lighting the bodies on fire. Okay. Okay. So now we're in between the point where he's trials done. Now uh, we're, waiting, we're awaiting sentencing. Okay. okay. This is where a potential bombshell comes in. Hmm. In between his conviction and sentencing, a guy named Rockland Riggs wrote a prison to prison letter to Ford. So I never knew you could do this, but apparently prisoners can write letters to each other. Hmm. Prison to prison letter at, so again, this is after Ford's conviction and before his sentencing, this guy Riggs is saying that he knew of a man named Will who planned on robbing Moret's house in January of 1997. Now you may ask, well, how does Riggs know this? He claims he and Will were driving around smoking crack in Ford's neighborhood when he was told this by Will. He said that he recognized Ford as someone who drove by him that night. And when he saw the reports of what was happening to Moret Ford, that's why he reached out. So essentially what he's saying is Riggs, he's saying himself and this guy named Will were staking out houses to rob because this guy Riggs was like a known burglar and that one of the houses they were going to rob was going to be Moret's house. Now he doesn't say that he robbed Moret's house. He right. doesn't say that he knew Will robbed Moret's house. He just said they were casing his house to potentially rob it. 
Listen, I've never never smoked crack before, Mike, but this seems like a very unlikely story that somebody in that condition would even be paying attention to somebody that just happened to pass them in the neighborhood, but then also remember that person later on. Seems very unlikely. Yeah, That's you know, just me. And, and I, I tend to agree with you, but nonetheless, you know, the defense gets this information. So after Moret gets this gets this letter, he obviously gives it to his defense attorney right away. Yeah. When a defense found out about this, they filed a motion for a new trial, and the sentencing was, his sentencing was delayed three times so they could look into this, like look into the validity of what Riggs said. Yeah. So now we're going to have a motion for a new trial. They get a motion for a new trial, and at this point, Riggs has to come testify. You know, this is the new evidence that's going to get that's going to help Moret supposedly. So they need him to testify as to basically what was in the letter and some more details on the specifics of what he's claiming. Mm -hmm. Riggs gets on the stand, this big sort of, you know, climaxing scene where everyone involved with the trial is there waiting to hear what this guy's going to say. And it turns out he's not even willing to testify. <laughs> they ask him questions and he pleads the fifth on every question as to not, you know, incriminate, potentially incriminate himself. But he's already in jail. Right. At this point, he was in jail when he wrote the letter. At this point, he was out on parole. Okay. So but maybe that that's sense. why I didn't want to say anything. But still, why even get involved in the first place if you're not willing yeah, to it, go further? And it leads to the question, why, you know, why did he why did he even come forward? Why why did or more importantly, why does he why does he think he's going to incriminate himself if he talks about what happens? Yeah. Now, Riggs had a history of burglary arrests. That could be a, you know, that could maybe be a reason as to why, you know, in, in saying what Will planned on doing or what he thought Will planned on doing or the conversations he and Will had that night, maybe it would get into, well, how did you know Will? You know what I mean? Yeah, and maybe, maybe he'd have to say, well, we robbed houses together. Yeah. You know, know, and then maybe he'd be putting himself in a situation where, you know, he had the test that he would then get in trouble for those crimes. Um, mm -hmm. There's people who thought maybe he was involved with the robbery at Moret's house. No one knows because he never testified. Well, surely he wasn't involved if he reached out and, and to Ford himself and brought that to attention. Why would he do that? Exactly. So, so this was more people on Moret's side theorizing this. Yeah, right? they're taking everything but they can exactly. why, why would he? Yeah, why would he give himself up? But so this, did the, this the, affect the, anything? The more strong theory for this is what I mentioned at first. Maybe in exposing Will, he would expose more bur burglaries he did, and maybe he didn't want to risk getting in trouble for those. Okay. So this did this affect the sentencing at all? It didn't affect anything, okay? The motion for the new trial was not granted because, again, the reason they were doing it is because of Riggs and he wouldn't testify. And on October 9th, 1998, Moret Ford is sentenced to 45 years in prison. Wow. He originally was not going to be eligible for parole until 2036 when he was 75, okay? Well, where this case takes another turn is there was a law that California passed in around 2017, from what I read, that because Moret Ford, by that, by 2023, he'll be 60 years old and he would have served 25 years in prison. Okay. That he can be eligible for a parole hearing at that time. Uh. Now, the only wrinkle with that is in order to be eligible, he has to take responsibility for his crimes. Ah, and he's never done that. He's never done that, still maintains his innocence, and there's no guarantee if he takes responsibility for his crimes that he's going to get parole. Okay. So there's – I was going to say that law sounds pretty troubling, but I guess if you have somebody that's taking uh, – you know, admitting to these things, I guess that kind of changes things a little bit. But still, hearing someone that could potentially get out of parole for something like this, yeah, that's, that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, and the flip side is he has to admit he did it. So once he yeah. admits he did it, would that affect his ability to get parole going forward if he doesn't get it this time? You yeah. know, I don't know how that all works. Right, who knows? Um, he still claims he's innocent. He filed appeals that were denied in 99 by the state court, in 2000 by the Supreme Court. The latest appeal I could find was from May of 2004. His, uh, that was his appeal to the California Circuit Court of Appeals, which was denied as well. Hmm. So he had all these appeals denied. Are you familiar with the Innocence Project? I am, yeah. Okay. So the Innocence Project in California basically gets cases sent to them by either inmates or people who 
on behalf of inmates. They review them and they decide whether they want to work with the, with the case, right? They decided to take his case because of the lack of physical evidence, eyewitness testimony, and the fact that he had he was non he had a nonviolent history. This right. is the first violent thing he was ever even accused of, never mind convicted of. Hmm. Now, what's interesting is they also talked to to Riggs, and he basically stuck to the same story he told in the letter to Moret Ford, but he still refuses to testify. Hmm. So that's where we're at right now. Terrible crime, br brutal in nature, really, really kind of a lot different than a lot of the other true crime stories we've done, Ben, because this guy had no criminal history, didn't have a bad upbringing, just like a sudden fit of rage. If you believe Moret Ford did it, he just had a sudden fit of rage that he couldn't control and it led to the most disastrous circumstances ever. And then he tried to cover it up by lighting the bodies on fire. Right. Yeah. It's terrible. It, it is. It is kind of interesting. This, that without much evidence at all, either he did a really good job of kind of covering himself. I mean, you know, even the circumstantial stuff, you know, it it sounds incriminating, but you know, it is just that it's circumstantial, and he had reasons for everything. It, just, it does make you think a little bit, but also like when I hear the story, like if he really, if he did, if he committed these things, and then had his brother go over there to, to discover it and put his brother in that position, that's. I mean, that's just Brutal. another another level of that, you know? Brutal. And look, those inconsistent statements, they he must have really portrayed those really poorly because it seems like that and his general demeanor are like the two things that got him convicted here. Yeah. Because um, I don't think any of that circumstantial evidence on its own would have been enough. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't fact. seem like it, but. Yeah. Now, an another random thing Ford has said in interviews since is that he wished he wasn't as high profile during his trial because if he felt like it impacted his trial <laughs> and he used the comparison to OJ Simpson, hmm. yeah. which I think is a bold comparison, especially since, you know, one big difference between Moret Ford and OJ Simpson, you could probably argue OJ celebrity maybe got him acquitted where it didn't help Moret at all. So I'm not sure what kind of parallel he was trying to draw here. Yeah. And even the, uh, the coverage of the case didn't get, I mean, a fraction of what OJ got. Exactly. That's the other part of it too is, you know, Moret might think a little too highly of himself because outside the Bay Area, I don't know many people remember who Moret Ford is unless you were a diehard college football fan in 1982. Yeah, I, I sure didn't. So yeah. uh, if somebody wants to go and find more information on this, is there anything out there? I know we, we said we picked this because there wasn't a ton, but there has to be at least some news coverage of this. Yeah, there was. There's stories in the San Fran Chronicle from back in the day from, from the trial um, also from post-trial, dealing with the appeals and the Innocence Project and things of that nature. Mark Curry, the prosecutor that I mentioned before, has a whole book on the Moret Ford case and his role in it. But I got a lot of information from news reports. And then what's very interesting, Ben, with this is, do you know who S.L. Price is? Yeah, writer. Very good writer. Yeah, writer. Uh, most, most famously uh, a writer for Sports Illustrated. Well, 20 years ago, he did a deep dive into this case interviewed everyone involved, Moret Ford, his family, victims' families, you know, former teammates, everyone. Mm -hmm. Did a whole feature on this, but it never made it to print hmm. in Sports Illustrated. His only piece that he said he ever fully wrote and didn't go to print. That's odd. Well, now he's going back 20 years later and taking a look for, you know, for SI. SI has a true crime podcast. The first season was on Steve McNair. Hmm. Well, the second season is going to be on the case of Moret Ford. Interesting. It was supposed to come out in January, but it's been delayed. It's going to come out later this year, and it's called Lateral Damage. Lateral Damage. Okay. I can't wait to see the angles he takes, and I'm curious to see if this case gains more steam as a whole when it's given you – know, hopefully it gains more steam by this podcast, right? That's what we hope, right? But, right. <laughs> but if it gains even more steam with SL Price's podcast because – this is something that his crimes are nowhere on YouTube. And the only things I could find on the internet were just nuts and bolts articles that talked about the crime. Hmm. Like I'm talking, Ben, YouTube, there's some Cal highlights from the from the play because it's very – obviously we went through it before, but nothing on him. And this is just one of those cases where you know, it seems like it would be right up the alley for podcasts and documentaries and things of that nature. Yeah, you would think so. Very interesting. Story of Moret Ford. We have it there. So thank you for listening, Mike. Thanks for taking us through it. If you have 
a true crime recommendation, suggestion, something you want to hear more about, send it to us. Leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, connect to us via the website, distantreplaypodcast.com. Hit us on Twitter, Instagram, any one of these ways. You can let us know. We'll love to hear from you. We'll do some research and bring it to you. But you know, we enjoy doing this and appreciate all the feedback we've gotten. Absolutely. I mean, we really enjoy doing these. Love the feedback. Love the, we're going to get back to your suggestions next week, but I came across this story on Marette Ford and I, I couldn't, couldn't like pass up doing it. I wanted to do it right away, but yeah. we'll get back to your suggestions next week. And, and thanks as always. So we appreciate you listening and subscribe, rate and review. We would greatly appreciate that. And we'll talk to you again on the next episode.